I'm Arrington Thompson, and I have a really, really good friend and a pleasure to speak again with um, Michael Sag, who is um, at UAB. Um, he is one of the, um, I guess, not necessarily founders, but one of the drivers behind um, the thing that we carry around in our in our on our in our pockets. Well, back in the old days, we had it in a little pocketbook, but the Sanford Guide. Um, he's been uh, instrumental in um, in AIDS research. And um, Mike, I appreciate you coming back and chatting with us a little bit about about monkeypox. But before we get into monkeypox, I wanted to um, I wanted to wander back by um, COVID because uh, President Biden said that the pandemic is over. Is is it over? Well, it depends on the flavor of political Kool Aid that you drink. If you drink uh, sort of the more GOP Republican side, you say, oh, he just made another blunder. And if you're on the Democratic Kool-Aid side, you go, yeah, put it in the context of his interview. And uh, he said that after we're continuing to work on this, uh, but uh, then followed that with the comment that the pandemic is over. Let me dissect just for a second what I think uh, he meant not to defend him. But on one level, I could say the pandemic is not over. Uh, we are still dealing with it. There's still 400 deaths a day, maybe up to 500. That is not a pandemic that's over. So we still need to do the work. We still need to um, continue to develop drugs, get the new vaccine out and in people's arms as rapidly as we can. And we'll talk about that in a second, I'm sure. Um, but no, the pandemic is not over. However, I think what he was implying is that the restrictions, the things that we had been putting ourselves through on a social level, that that part is over. Now, I could debate whether that's wise or not. I still wear a mask on airplanes. I'm maybe one out of 20 who are wearing masks on airplanes. One out of 100. Wear... Yeah, maybe. <laughs> and I don't understand. I couldn't be a flight attendant and not wear a mask. I just, with all the people around... And I think all of us, just a reality check, ask yourself, in the last three weeks, how many of your friends have come down with COVID? For me, it's about six. Yeah. Now, fortunately, they're not getting terribly ill, and I'm prescribing Paxlovid early and often, uh, meaning aggressively. Um, but it's not over in that sense. But for people who are not immunocompromised, who don't have B-cell deficiencies, um, most of us, when we're vaccinated, especially and up to date, we're not going to get sick enough to go to the hospital or die from this. So I think that's where Biden was coming out and saying all these draconian restrictions that we have been going through that slowed down um, commerce, the economy. I think that's what he was declaring. I'm not here to defend him. I'm just saying the pandemic is not over, but perhaps uh, we can relax some of our constraints and be monitoring for uh, an upsurge in cases, which could happen. All it's going to take is a new variant, just one right. new variant. And then we got to rethink. So uh, let's talk about, we've now got this bivalent vaccine that's out. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the robust data with this vaccine that we had with the previous vaccine. What are your thoughts on this early rollout and who should who should stand in line and, and roll up their sleeves? Well, it's a great question. Uh, my personal view is that what we're dealing with is a competition of relative risk. And for those of us who are physicians, we this is what we do in our daily practice. I mean, you could be in the operating room and you have a decision to make while the while a patient's on the table and you're weighing out relative risk if I, ligate this artery or if I remove this organ in a certain way, there's going to be an outcome and I'm going to weigh that out right on the spot. Well, the same thing's happening uh, in public health, except the patient is the population, not a person on an operating table. So in that regard, we know that we've got a rapidly spreading virus still, the pandemic is not over, and we have vaccine, uh, several vaccines for which there are now not just a couple hundred thousand, there are hundreds of millions of case experiences that demonstrate the efficacy and the safety of the vaccines. So 
as a new variant can emerge, just like with influenza, we create a new vaccine every year based on experience, in this case, where of in Australia, where their summer is the opposite of ours, and their winter happens during our summer, they watch what happens in Australia, and then they assume that the vac- that the influenza virus that's causing trouble in Australia will cause it in the U.S., and they make the vaccine based on that, but they don't have um, efficacy or safety data on that specific entity. So they've used that roadmap, copy and pasted it into COVID with the experience that we've had in COVID vaccine safety and efficacy. They checked it in some animal models to make sure there was nothing surprising. There wasn't. And then they moved it out to the public. The early returns on this bivalent vaccine are just short of spectacular. The immune response is is really fabulous. Uh, Antibody levels are being kicked up nicely. And the antibodies against that variant, BA5, which is well, the one that our my friends are getting right now, and your friends, all of us, um, that protection will be there. So if you've had the original series, the first two shots, and then ideally one or two other boosters, now is pretty much the time to get the bivalent vaccine. I would prioritize people over the age of 50, especially those over the age of 65, Anybody who's got any kind of underlying medical condition that puts them at risk for bad outcomes with COVID, and that includes obesity, a BMI over 30, um, you should go out. If it's been more than three to four months since your last booster, get your bo- get your booster now with the bivalent vaccine. Um, question comes up, well, can I get it with the influenza vaccine? Yes, you can. I personally am choosing not to do that because I've had reactions to the COVID vaccine, I think because I had COVID early on, but you can weigh that out yourself, but it's okay to do it together. I choose to separate by a couple of weeks. All right. Well, I'm going to separate mine by a couple of weeks because that's your recommendation. So let's, let's, um, let's transition to monkeypox. Um, and as the name says, um, it was originally isolated in monkeys, but that's not its usual reservoir, is it? Or, 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 or is it? Well, it's in the animal community. There's it, it mostly had been in sub-Saharan Africa. There are two specific clades. The clade one is the one that's uh, really more aggressive in a way and causes more deaths. And that's the one we had mostly encountered, for example, in the United States. There was an outbreak in 2003 of some, uh, I believe it was prairie dogs that were imported into, I think it was Wisconsin. And handlers of that, uh, those animals, uh, became infected with the monkeypox clade one. They did okay, um, but for the most part, that's the one that, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, has been associated with up to a 10 to 12% mortality rate. Now, the clade that's spreading around the world right now is a clade two, and it is spread like from animals to humans like any other zoonotic infection. What's different is that we've never seen before documented, or not much anyway, documented person-to-person spread that didn't involve uh, an animal uh, reservoir uh, to infect humans. That's what's different. We noticed that it started spreading among communities where um, there was uh, sexual activity, uh, mostly skin-to-skin contact, um, especially if it was prolonged for more than just a few minutes. And people that had open lesions that were even crusted lesions were transmitting. And so that was started to spread, especially within um, the uh, MSM, the Men Who Have Sex With Men community. And it spread pretty rapidly nationwide and across uh, all of Europe and uh, et cetera, uh, very fast. So that started raising its head around April, May of this year. And you can see how quickly it hit in the United States, such that we were seeing lots of cases by July and August. Fortunately, through the efforts of all of us, really, um, the number of cases is starting to dissipate now. It's not gone. Saw a case yesterday in my uh, HIV clinic. uh, But we have tools. Very robust testing is now available. It wasn't too much ago, months ago. 
We have vaccines that are effective. I know we'll talk about that. And also uh, a therapeutic uh, ticovormat, which uh, most of us just call TPOX. Um, and, and so the tools are there. We're starting to use them and we're starting to see results. So let's talk about what this virus looks like, um, because that seems to be one of the one of the keys. Let me see if I can share my screen, um, which is going to test my ability to use. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. And this is something that I got off the WHO website. Is this what it looks like or or that or... looks? Yeah. That the first picture looks more to me like smallpox, to be honest, because it's they're more robust. Um, blisters are a little bit larger. Um, and while uh, the lower part of that slide, the the lower part of that, uh, I believe it's their thigh, perhaps that umbilicated lesion right at the bottom, that's a little bit more typical. Yes, that one. That's okay. the one that's a little bit more typical for monkeypox. But what's key to this, it's true for all the pox viruses. Uh, like this. Those look pretty typical, and they oftentimes come on all at once, uh, so there's a, a synchronous release of the skin lesions. On the palms and soles, you think of that with syphilis. It happens with monkeypox and smallpox, um, and, and the lesions um, are quite painful, and that's different than syphilis. These are very painful lesions. So okay. the classic story, just to recap it, is Exposure, five to 12 days later, onset of a viral prodrome, headache, lymphadenopathy, feeling bad. Uh, there can be a cough, which gets to the respiratory potential transmission. It is not a major transmission, but it's theoretically possible. Um, and then after that, the release of the skin lesions, um, depending on the site of exposure, they can be in the anal genital area. Uh, the patient I saw yesterday had a wicked pro uh, proctitis, um, very uh, tender uh, in the in the area of his bottom and into the rectum, and uh, had a little bit of a discharge. Um, and and this is a type of thing that we see. The length of symptoms can be up to three to four weeks, usually around two to three weeks as a rule. And during that entire time, even when the lesions are crusted. They should still be considered to be contagious. We like to keep people isolated until all the new symptoms are gone for five days in a row, and then they can start to re-engage, but they should be careful uh, around others, especially for skin-to-skin -skin contact, until all the lesions are replaced by intact skin. And those are the general rules that we want to follow. It is a miserable illness. Um, it is just miserable. The patients uh, don't want to eat. Um, they feel awful. The pain is significant, um, it's debilitating in some people's case. Um, and, and along with that, as you can imagine, comes stigma. Right. Um, you know, with other, even with HIV, somebody can have it, but they don't necessarily have skin lesions that say, look at me. <laughs> you know, I've got monkeypox. I've got HIV. The monkeypox sort of jumps out and says, I'm a leper, in essence, and the patients internalize that stigma, and it's it's psychologically debilitating as well. So, as a trauma surgeon, I have to focus in on this pain aspect. What, what how are we going to treat, or what is your usual thoughts about treating the pain? Can we can we just use over the counter, you know, Tylenol, ibuprofen, or or is the pain so significant they may need they may need other medications? Well, they, they might need other medications. I think ever since the, uh, like a lot of us, since the opioid crisis uh, and the overuse of narcotics, I think I shy away from using opioids unless I know it's going to be a, for a very finite period. I try to go no longer than five to seven days for a number of reasons. But acutely, I might use an opioid. But for sure, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs alternating with Tylenol, uh, for local lesions, you can use uh, a lidocaine patch or use some different type of analgesic topically. Um, the, the other problem with opioids, at least in the patients that I see uh, in the HIV clinic, who are oftentimes men who have sex with men, um, they get proctitis, as my patient yesterday had. 
And if you give a lot of opioids, they become obstipated and they have enormous pain with bowel movements. So it's a balancing act, but I would sparingly use opioids when I'd use it when I feel like I have to, but I try to find other ways to manage the pain. Oh, and the treatment with TPOX, which is recommended now uh, for most, all the patients, at least that I see who have immunocompromised that is HIV, even though it's minimal immunocompromised for those who are successfully treated, um, TPOX will shorten the duration of symptoms pretty dramatically and especially the pain. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Um, I wanted to talk about what makes this a public health emergency um, opposed to, you know, all the other things that we see on a day-to-day basis. Um, can you address that? Sure. Uh, I think the the general public wouldn't have a reason to understand this, but those of us in medicine, especially in public policy, get this immediately. And that is the use of the term public health emergency is more of a technical release of resources to address an emerging problem. So it's just like if the storm hits the Gulf Coast and uh, it causes flooding, in order for the um, FEMA and others to be released to the area, they declare a uh, um, an emergency situation on the Gulf Coast. By declaring a public health emergency, resources are released that allow immediate um, uh, access to uh, all types of resources within the federal government. And that's what we need to do. So even though it's not the general public who's at risk from, from monkeypox, I think that's clear. Uh, within the subpopulations of people who it is being transmitted uh, within that population, uh, the, the notion of the emergency allows us to do resources. Uh, on the screen now, you're showing how the cases peaked by early to mid-August but we're seeing a downtrend now in the number of cases. And that, I think, coincides with the declaration of a public health emergency, the release of resources. Um, one of my friends uh, who works at CDC, Dimitri Daskalaskis, who is pulled from CDC to the White House so that he can focus like a laser on monkeypox. And I think getting the information out, getting the vaccines out, starting studies to demonstrate uh, the best use of these uh, products, because we hadn't ever used them before, hadn't had a reason they were developed for smallpox, all that, all those resources of the federal government are being directed at a response to this epidemic, and I think it's working. So for those who say, oh, the government is slow, the government doesn't do uh, much for me, I think this is a good example of how uh, the government has been pulled into action. And so far, at least in the last three to four weeks, I think we're starting to see some positive results. Um, I think you touched on this a little bit earlier, but I wanted to um, highlight it again, is about testing and about vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, as you recall, in the early days of COVID, we really didn't have tests. We had to roll them out. And I think we again, probably from what you said, declaring a health emergency, it seems like we had problems with tests and now we're better? Yeah, we we are better, certainly for COVID. We have the home tests now. Uh, but but it took, a, it took, I think, too long. Uh, back in January to May, especially of 2020, we were not ready uh, and, and it was slow. The monkeypox testing was slow to begin with. Uh, but they rapidly have uh, approved labs, for example, at my institution and probably most uh, major laboratories around the country that have PCR technology, and especially if they can do COVID testing by PCR, translating, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> sorry. It's all right. Those who have testing centers around the country for COVID, they're able to um, pretty nimbly switch over to testing for monkeypox. There is, there are requirements. Um, my, should I think we should go through this where uh, if you see a patient you suspect with monkeypox, um, isolate them in a, in a room in whatever clinic or emergency room that you're in. Um, make sure that when the healthcare workers in, they're using 
basically the same garb that they used uh, when they went into COVID rooms, that is gowns, gloves, masks, N95. And if you're going to be doing procedures like collecting specimen, I would recommend a face shield um, while you're doing that procedure. You go in, you uh, find the act, ideally the active weeping lesions, or you unroof a, um, a blistered lesion, and you take uh, a swab, uh, collect the specimen, put it into viral transport medium that your uh, healthcare center almost certainly has available for you right now. And if not, you should make sure that they provide that for you. Um, and then you get it, put it in a biohazard bag and you ship it off to ideally your local lab, like in our case at a university health center. We have that. If you don't, uh, you could send it to a public health department down the street or around the corner uh, and they can do testing for you. You should work out that uh, process for, for them. And, and then you get the results back. If the patient is immunocompromised or has other uh, conditions like a topic dermatitis or things that puts them at high risk for prolonged illness or widespread of this virus, um, then you would immediately uh, try to access uh, ticrovirumat, which we'll call TPOX, and you can start them on therapy. It does require forms. It does require so a lot of paperwork. I filled that out yesterday. Uh, it took about seven minutes to get all the information on the sheet and an informed consent. But if you're anticipating, if you're in an emergency room, if you're in an HIV clinic, if you're in an area where you're going to be seeing people at risk for monkeypox, those who are getting it mostly, which is mostly through sexual transmission, um, having those things set up in advance will allow you to provide the best patient uh, care and you can get them the TPOX on the spot. So as this patient uh, left our clinic yesterday, he had two bottles of TPOX in hand with instruction, then he could start the medicine immediately before we had the actual lab result from the hospital, just based on his symptoms, which as I mentioned already was proctitis, skin lesions, um, and, uh, and a clinical syndrome, plus an exposure in his case, that he had been exposed uh, 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 20 days earlier, um, and he had symptoms for about 12 days, which is a classic presentation. Um, and that gets me into contact tracing. Are we doing that for monkeypox? We're trying, um, and I think it's the ideal. So in this person's case, he had a regular partner who was diagnosed with monkeypox around uh, two and a half, three weeks ago, uh, if we had, if he had been aware that says my patient, um, he should have uh, gone to the health department to request a vaccine because getting a vaccine within four days of an exposure is very protective. Um, we are not using so much right now, at least for non severely immunocompromised patients. We're not using prophylaxis with uh, antiviral drugs, but the vaccine would be a great option for him uh, uh, almost the day of his partner being diagnosed and treated with TPOX. Um, that would be the ideal. Um, the other people who are eligible for vaccines right now, besides those at risk, which I would say are, are um, men who have sex with men, especially if they are in a community where there's a large number of cases, uh, immunocompromised patients otherwise who are coming, have the likelihood of coming into contact with somebody with um, monkeypox. And that could include healthcare workers. Um, we're now uh, in our clinic, those who are seeing uh, the monkeypox cases on the front line, they have all been vaccinated now. And early on, we had a concern about the availability of vaccine um, because the dose was fairly large. Um, and we didn't have a large supply, maybe a million doses. Through some of the uh, work and preclinical development, they just they determined that one fifth of the dose would provide almost the same type of immunity. So we went to a one fifth dose that obviously increased supply from one million doses to our uh, case uh, uh, series from 1 million case series coverage, that is two shots, uh, to 5 million. And now we have an ample supply of vaccine 
And so that that also is probably part of the reason we're emerging from or seem to be emerging from the epidemic at the moment. So in our last couple of minutes, um, what are the things that clinicians need to be aware of? What should they take away from our discussion? We should all be aware that monkeypox is in the community for most all of us around the United States. It's transmitted from skin to skin contact from prolonged especially more than just a few minutes. That occurs, obviously, during sexual encounters. It is not specifically a sexually transmitted infection because while it can be transmitted sexually, and that is maybe the predominant way, it is not the only way that the virus is transmitted, making it different from most other STIs. And so it can be transmitted from uh, other types of close skin-to-skin contact, especially when there are lesions present. Uh, We know that it can theoretically be transmitted through the respiratory route uh, or through um, uh, saliva that may be uh, uh, aerosolized or spread. That's a very low risk, but it's possible. Um, But most of the cases that skin-to-skin contact, there have been uh, uncommon transmissions uh, from contaminated bed sheets, towels, that type of thing. So if you have access or if you're if you're exposed to someone with uh, monkeypox, then uh, you want to make sure that in the house they are cleaning um, appropriately the bed sheets and towels. Um, and then in advance, ideally, all of us as physicians uh, and providers should know uh, how we would manage this when somebody presents to our healthcare facility and what we're looking for in a patient, are people that have had either a known exposure and then developed symptoms or somebody coming in de novo with what looks like, say, syphilis, skin lesions, especially on palms and soles, uh, preceded in most cases by a prodrome of a viral-like constitutional uh, syndrome, and uh, especially be looking for anal genital region uh, and in the case of men who have sex with men, proctitis uh, or area around uh, the anal area. Uh, with lesions. Michael Sag, I really, really appreciate you being with us. As usual, you're bringing the information and I really appreciate it. I want you to have a good day and I'm going to give you a rest. I can't think of anything else we need to talk about next month. Okay. Thanks, Arrington. It's great to be back with you. Hey, you have a good day. Thank you.